Hi, everyone. Welcome to our White House Google Hangout on local foods. I'm John Carson. I'm the director of the Office of Public Engagement. So excited to have you all following us live today. We're joined by women entrepreneurs from across the country who are woke, working on uh, local foods, creating jobs, creating local food networks. Uh, we're going to be using the hashtag today, WH Hangout. So those of you following live, we've got some great participation, some great questions so far, but please keep them coming throughout the session. We hope to take a lot of questions today. Very excited personally about this, uh, this subject. Uh, you can see behind me over my shoulder here, that's a picture of the farm I grew up on in Western Wisconsin. Also really excited about the theme that we picked today, women entrepreneurs, leaders in local food. Um, I got to see some of those leaders when I was growing up. My grandmother was just as much a, uh, the driver of, of the farm I grew up on as, as my grandfather and, and rest of the family were. Also excited about what this administration has gotten done to support local food and the efforts that that folks like those joining us today have been doing. And, and with us today, we have someone who knows an awful lot about that, both from her past work and her leadership here in the administration. So joining us and who I'm gonna kick it over to talk about some of the great work that's going on at USDA is our Deputy Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, Kathleen Merrigan. Thank you, John. It's great to be back. It was about five months ago mm -hmm. that we released the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food Compass in its original version. Today is the 2.0 version. We're really excited about the map, the geospatial mapping tool, the additional case studies and our narrative. Everybody should use this tool. I think of the movie Field of Dreams. And the voice says, yeah. if you build it, they will come. We've built it. Excellent. We need people to come. I want to give you a little example of the map. I want to go straight to it. Let me show you how it can be used. It's new and improved. I consider it 100% better in terms of its navigational uh, capacity. It is uh, full of a lot more data. So here's an example that we're pulling up now. And this is um, what you can do when you hit the dots on the map in your community. We're pulling up uh, Schmidt Farms in Oberlin, Kansas. So when you look at the map, this helps you explain um, figure out what USDA resources can be used for. So Schmidt Farms use some of our resources to help its product line to include beef and poultry to expand it. When you go and you do these drop down menus, you can find out where the money came from, how much money. You can network across the country with people who have used USDA resources. USDA is this vast bureaucracy, hard to figure out where things are. So we chose the name Compass with purpose. Uh, yep. It gives direction. It shows you where to go. So we are hoping that people use this tool. Were we able to show the map? Okay. All right. Now, I want to explain why women. Excellent. So when I started to go around the countryside looking at this mapping tool myself, I noticed that there are a lot of women who are leading projects and farms across the country. In fact, women uh, farm operators have increased 30% since 2002. So this is not just a casual journey on the map. This is a true fact. And since you brought a photograph, I wanted to bring my oh, own right. photograph. So just a few months ago, I'm going to try to show this. I went to the National Women in Agriculture Conference down in Tuskegee, Alabama. We're all pretty in pink and wearing our hats. But um, really fun talking to women farmers and women small business operators who are really jazzed about the local food environment. And so I think that um, we could have chosen a lot of themes today. We could have focused on local meat or farm to school, or um, we could have picked a particular region. But I thought, why not shout out to the women who, in a lot of ways, are leading across the country. So um, we're going to go right straight to the very special women leaders that we've invited to join us in our hangout today. And I want to start with my friend, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake, who is doing a, a, just a great job in Baltimore. And I know she has things to share. Madam Mayor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Secretary. And I, I truly hope you enjoyed your time in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So Baltimore is a city that takes food access seriously. With 190,000 people currently enrolled in SNAP benefits, uh, we've taken a local, local food system approach linking food access 
with our vacant land, as well as an urban ag agriculture agriculture strategy. Sorry, I'm getting the mid-afternoon. <laughs> so, so for instance, we've identified 20 acres of vacant land for agriculture purposes in Baltimore City. We've changed the building co code to simplify the process for building hoop houses, uh, which are helpful to year-round uh, farming. And we're currently developing an urban agriculture plan. We're in the process of changing the zoning code to encourage urban agriculture and other innovative land uses to improve food access in Baltimore City. The Real Food Farm is one of the farms highlighted on the USDA Compass map. We hopefully can show that later. Uh, we've transformed an overgrown park and, a, and school grounds into a thriving urban farm. We built seven hoop houses. And we have a, a mobile produce truck that sells in food desert neighborhoods. Uh, we, the uh, Real Food Farm accepts SNAP benefits and it sells at our local uh, farmers markets. They're one of 12 urban farms in Baltimore. And to date, there are 22 hoop houses within the city limits. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, urban farming intersects with food access through our farmers markets. And there are eight Baltimore farmers markets that accept SNAP benefits and provide double incentive coupons for SNAP recipients. And the deputy secretary had a chance to see that uh, firsthand this past Sunday. Our largest farmers market with over 86 vendors serving 7,000 customers every Sunday launched its uh, SNAP benefit and EBT card reader. Uh, on a national note, as the vice chair of the US, U.S. Conference of Mayors Food Policy Task Force, mayors across the country are addressing food access through a food systems approach, partnering with local and regional farmers and increasing access to healthy, affordable food as a part of this task force. Uh, and in, in conclusion, Baltimore has made great strides in uh, food access and urban farming, and we cannot thank the USDA enough and the Obama administration for the support and the commitment on these issues. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to leave uh, early from this event, but I, I would not have missed it uh, for the world. And if you have any uh, questions, please post them on the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative Facebook page. Thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. You're doing just great work out there in Baltimore. What an impressive array of activities. and. What's happening in Baltimore, John, is happening across the countryside. I just wanted to quickly throw out a couple of things that have happened since we announced the first compass in the last five months. USDA put out $4 million more dollars to states across the country for elect electronic benefit transfer capacity at farmers markets for SNAP recipients. We see a growth. In 2009, $4.4 million redeemed in SNAP benefits at farmers markets. 2010, 7.5 million. Last year, 11.7 million. It's going up. And I think that's a really good thing. So let's go um, a, on a journey around the country. And let's move um, over to Oregon. And let's start where food comes from. We, we got the, the consumption part. The mayor started us off with um, what she's doing there and in the inner cities. Let's go to a producer and let's talk to our friend Corey. Corey, welcome to our hangout. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Merrigan, for having me here. Um, I'm Corey Kerman. I'm from Wallawa, Oregon. We raise and market 100% grass-fed beef, and we sell in the Pacific Northwest. Um, as most people know, there are some huge challenges in, in raising and marketing local food, and we have received a ton of help from USDA in our success. Some of that has come from um, our farm ownership loan and for beginning farmers that we've received from FSA, our operating loan, and most recently a value-added producer grant to help us explore more retail options. So we're really excited about the new map and how usable and great it is. I anticipate using it to connect with other people who are trying to do the same types of things as we are. Excellent. Thanks, Corey. We have a lot of interest in local meat as part of the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative. And since we uh, launched the first version, our economic research service has come out with a, with a new um, report, Slaughter and Processing Options, Issues for Locally uh, Sourced Meat, which I hope will be a good resource for people out there who are listening. So we're um, looking forward to asking Corey a lot of questions, but let's continue on our navigational uh, effort here going around the country and I'd like to visit Wisconsin my hometown your oh yes Wisconsin uh, Wisconsin Wisconsin uh, we have Sue Noble there from 
um, the Vernon Economic Development Association, and I actually got to visit Sue in the project that she's about to describe, and she is one of the new case studies that are in our new uh, narrative that goes along with the Compass. Sue, welcome to our Hangout. Thanks for having me today. I'm glad to share what the work that we're doing in our region and a lot of work with USDA, a lot of good partnerships. I'm the executive director of Vernon Economic Development Association, which is a nonprofit organization in a very rural agricultural area of Western Wisconsin. We're creating new community wealth by developing a regional food system. We have a strong farm to school program and we have many farmers markets in the region. And about three years ago when a major manufacturing plant closed and we lost 81 jobs in the community, our organization acquired the property and has turned it into a 100,000 square foot multi-tenant facility for food aggregation, storage, processing and distribution businesses to start up and expand. We currently have three tenants already that we did the build outs for last fall and they are Kewaden Organics, which aggregates produce from 70 other growers in the region. And then they distribute it to wholesale, retail and restaurant markets under their just local brand. Then we have Lusa Organics, who uses local food ingredients to make body uh, care products and ships those to markets worldwide. They start in the basement of their house and now they're in our building. The Fifth Season Cooperative also is a new business that coordinates moving local food into schools, hospitals, and universities in the region. And then we've also just completed the construction of a new commercial kitchen, which is huge, and we're looking for tenants in that commercial kitchen. And I think partnerships have been very key to our success, especially I want to thank USDA for their Rural Business Enterprise Grant Program that provided funding to buy the first coolers for Key Wade and Organic Space. We also got a $2 million US Department of Commerce EDA grant that helped us renovate the structure of the building. And then we've used other tools like TIF revenues with the city of Iroquois, five banks in the region participating in a disaster area bond, and then other support from local and state grants and private investors. So we have plenty of space in our building. We're looking for tenants. We have a lot of opportunities for people to invest in our project. And we really believe we're turning the food movement into action here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sue. Um, certainly our president is all the time talking about jobs, jobs, and local food can create jobs. We've got a number of studies, and throughout our time today, I want to mention a number of them. Just one recently from um, 2011, Clemson University in South Carolina. They analyzed their existing locally grown campaign, found that producer revenue went up $22 million a year, and they created 200 new jobs. So Sue's there trying to create jobs in Wisconsin. It's happening across the country. So let's continue on our journey. I want to go to Oklahoma, where uh, they have some great farm to school stuff going on. And so my friend Chris Kirby is on the line. Welcome to the Hangout, Chris. Hi, thanks. It's a pleasure to be a part of this today. I love Farm to School and it's such a great opportunity bringing that connection between children and our farming community, the hands-on aspects for our children, and also the economic opportunities that it brings to our farming community. You know, one thing that I've seen with Farm to School is partnerships are a key on the national level, regional, state, and within our local community levels too. And distribution has been an area Area that has really helped us a lot in getting the local produce and farm products to the schools. And through distribution, we've linked in with our existing infrastructure here in Oklahoma with our family owned companies, all the way up to our corporate companies that are helping us see a 70% increase in food that will be going to the schools this fall. So the kiddos are gonna be eating wonderful seedless watermelons, sweet cantaloupe, cherry tomatoes, zucchini squash, and so many other great things. And so that has really been good on a statewide level. Another model that we're working with is where we help link our farmers directly with the schools in their community. And one thing that I've recently seen the results of is the USDA NRCS, Natural Resource and Conservation 
services program with the hoop house cost share program and more and more farmers are able to put these hoop houses in and grow outside the normal growing season into the fall the winter and early spring and provide wonderful wonderful food to our schools throughout the, the, that time in school it's a pleasure to be here and i look forward to being with you the rest of the time Thanks a lot, Chris. You know, John, when I went to Oklahoma to visit a farm to school site, the farmers actually come in and have lunch with the kids oh, in the lunchroom. And it was really exciting. And uh, they actually, the kids actually talked about the watermelon on that particular journey. What, people out, <laughs> what people out there may not know is that since the first release of the Compass, we have put out a farm to school grant program that was part of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Uh, championed by our own first lady. Mm -hmm. And um, we will be putting out those grants uh, later this year. And we're really, really excited about the interest out there, the excitement. Absolutely. Shall we continue Let's on? Let's move on. Let's move on. I want to go to Washington State and uh, visit with a young woman. I think she's the youngest in our hangout here today. I'm not telling my age. <laughs> and, uh, and I want to visit my friend Valerie. Um, and Valerie, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. You came to visit me in my office recently, shared with me a particular map that you've been working on. And I think you're a really great young leader. Thank you. Good afternoon. And yes, it's such an honor to be here um, among all these really strong women who are doing good work in their communities. Um, and my name is Valerie Segrest, and I'm a member of the Muckleshoot Tribe. And I work as a, the community nutritionist and the coordinator for the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project. And there are so many supporters of the project, um, Northwest Indian College, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and then the USDA Special Emphasis Grant Program is really what's helped build the foundation for this work to happen. Uh, and so the, the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project really aims to increase access to both traditional and local healthy foods within our community. And one of the ways we did that was through the map that I came and shared with you, which was a community map food mapping process that uh, brought in several tribal members to really take a look at what their food system looked like. Um, and from there, we were able to, to create more uh, work for ourselves and take a look at what we needed to really, uh, what work needed to be done in the community. And so we do, uh, we try to increase access to local and healthy traditional foods through nutrition education programs that really focus on the teachings of our foods and medicines. We've installed and maintained several community gardens for Muckleshoot programs that serve as education centers as well as food production areas within our community. We hold cooks retreats that bring together tribal cooks from our community kitchens to share their skills and nurture their culinary talent. And we've participated also in the King County Farm to Table initiatives where I'm proud to report that Muckleshoot was the uh, biggest purchaser within that program. And so for the next 12 months, we're going to be doing more menu development across our kitchens and use that, that uh, what's coming out of these menus to serve as future food policy for the tribe. But, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is just how well my community has responded to this project. I'm so proud of Muckleshoot and uh, really grateful to be serving my community this way. So thanks for having me. Oh, great, thank you. And I, I do want people out there to know that since, um, since uh, our last visit, we have put out a new proposed rule on a microloan program that's really gonna help beginning farmers, smaller size farmers, people who are looking for less than $25,000 help from the Farm Service Agency. It's going to reduce the paperwork and um, the burden of having history and crops and, and such. I, I think it's going to really help a lot of people out there who are interested in getting their hands in the soil. And we need help from everyone who's watching today um, and all of our participants in getting the word out on this. I think what's so great about the Compass is it's one-stop shopping for each of these programs and these great stories. So you have inspiration and, and ways people can get involved all in one spot. We've got one more stop Let's before Q and A's and we're gonna go all the way down to New Mexico and we're gonna visit our friend Pam Roy who is doing great things with uh, New Mexico and the Food Policy Council. Welcome to our hangout, Pam. 
Thank you, Deputy Secretary Merrigan, and thank you so much for the invitation to participate today with this really amazing group of ladies. Uh, as uh, Deputy Secretary said, my name is Pam Roy. I'm the Executive Director of Farm to Table and the Coordinator of the New Mexico Food and Agriculture Policy Council in New Mexico. Um, there are now over 200 local and state food policy councils across the country. And the reason why uh, this is a, a burgeoning group of agencies and organizations working together is that they're change makers. Um, we, have the, uh, we have a great way to create allies and build beneficial partnerships between food, agriculture, health, economic, and environmental organizations and agencies. As an example, here in New Mexico, we have effectively helped to introduce and, in, and expand programs like the Federal Farmers Market Nutrition Program, which here in New Mexico, along with the Food Stamp Program or SNAP um, at farmers markets, have really helped our seniors, children, and families um, who are nutritionally at risk be able to shop at local farmers markets, of which we have 60 of them here in New Mexico now. Also, we help to develop the statewide farm to school program here in New Mexico. It is a state, uh, we're a state where we have 225,000 children who are nutritionally at risk. And we work, we work with the state, um, our Food Policy Council worked with our state to um, actually get them to fund the purchase of New Mexico grown fruits and vegetables for school meals. At the same time, our Food Policy Council worked at the federal level, as Deputy Secretary Merrigan mentioned, on federal nutrition rules to add more fresh fruits and vegetables to school meals. Um, we also have 189 schools that now benefit from the fresh fruit and vegetable snack program, um, and our school children love that program. Ultimately, these programs have increased New Mexico farmers' income um, by $3.5 million on an annual basis. Um, and we're seeing new farmers and next generation farmers getting into the businesses. And really, our USDA programs like the Community Food Project Grant Program, the Getting Farmer and Rancher Program, and Outreach and Assistance for Socially Disadvantaged Farmers have been some of the major programs here in New Mexico that have benefited them to increase their businesses and offer incredible produce to all of us. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Pam. Okay, so um, we're going to go to questions at this point. But before we do that, and John's got a whole a slew of them. They're coming in fast and furious, which is really great, just what we hope. But I did want to, and John does to acknowledge before we do this, we're celebrating local foods. We're talking about opportunities and resources. But we do have this phenomenal drought that's going on out there. And, you know, it could be uh, breaking a lot of records. There are a lot of people out there who are, whether they're selling globally, nationally, or locally, they're, they're really losing some of their crop, and it's tough. And I just want to say, if you're out there and you're a producer and you're listening, um, we're sorry for what's, what you're facing. We're trying to do what we can to help. And if you're a consumer out there, um, recognize that our people on our working hands are, are struggling right now. So I just wanted to it's throw that the, out. Uh, one of the driest Junes we've seen uh, in the last century. Yes. Well, let's, uh, let's go to questions. Uh, let me remind everyone, we are using the hashtag WHHangout. Uh, uh, getting some great questions here, but keep them coming. We have a uh, first one here from uh, Reedsberger asks on Twitter, how can we make the scaling up of local foods more sustainable? I think something many of our folks here have dealt with, but Corey, this sounds like something uh, for you based on, on what you're doing. Um, how, would, how are you dealing with uh, staying sustainable as you're scaling up? That is an excellent question. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we have as local food producers is scaling to a point where we can stay true to the values that our customers care about, but um, take advantage of some of the, fish, of, of the efficiencies to make our products more affordable. Um, we're still figuring that out, as are a lot of people across the country. I think the map is going to help us network. I think it's going to help us find distributors that are the right size to take our products to market at a reasonable rate. Um, it's a great question. It's an ongoing struggle that I think we'll continue to tackle together. Excellent. Could I just say, we have also put out at USDA recently two food hub um, pieces of work that may help people. We put out a regional food hub resource guide in April of this year, and uh, moving food along the value chain, another report in March. Those are, can be found on our website. And as Corey said, that whole distribution 
challenge um, really needs to be figured out to make it economical. And so to the extent that those resources are there to help, people should use them. Excellent. Well, along these lines, Sue, a question for you. Uh, Quest Lakes asked us via Twitter, um, says our regional healthy food hub incorporates schools, community gardens, food pantries. Um, and is that a national trend in Viroqua or in Westby? Are you getting questions from other parts of the country? And are you seeing that trend uh, start to spread nationally? Oh, definitely. Our fifth season cooperative that does that coordination to institutional markets is getting questions from all over the United States. The operations manager, Diane Chapita, has been very good about responding to those folks. So keep the questions coming. We've been asked to uh, talk about our model nationally. We were in Washington in May about it. Um, but people really want to be able to have that local food available in the institutional cafeterias. And if there's any way that what we're doing can help other folks learn what works for them, please contact us and we'll share with you what we know and what we've learned and try to help folks along. But it definitely is, I see it as a trend and a very good one. Excellent, thank you, Sue. And I think that really is the main goal of our chat today to help share these stories and, and keep this conversation going. Along those lines, Chris, a, a question for you. Um, Oklahoma Cooks uh, tweeted to us, it's so sad to see our young children eating so few whole foods in schools. Help us change this. Do you want to talk about as a farm to school coordinator um, in Oklahoma, what's your advice for someone who's concerned about this and, and how they can get involved? You know, I'm starting to see or I see it all the time. We've got some very progressive schools out there that they're serving a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables on their salad bar. They're linking with their local farmers. They're serving it on their, their food lines and they just jump in and do it. They slice it, dice it, they put it out for the kids and make it accessible and the children are gobbling it up. We've also just recently introduced a new cookbook that are full of fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables for local uh, food service and it's available online and we did some training about slicing and dicing techniques and just to make that process a little bit easier and bring more partners into the process because it's everybody working together to make this happen. I'm going to steal that motto, just jump in and do it. I yeah. like that. <laughs> um, well, uh, a question both for the Deputy Secretary and for Valerie, advice for new and beginning farmers. What is USDA doing? Valerie, what's your advice to young people who are looking at this as an option? Well, I guess I'll start. We have a new program that we've been doing with the American Farm Bureau Federation called Start to Farm. And if you go to our National Ag Library, you can, through our website, you can find all the materials there. Also, many of our programs are structured by statute to have a preferential treatment, if you will, for beginning farmers, which USDA defines as under 10 years in farming. So. You heard a lot of talk about those hoop houses or seasonal high tunnels. If you're a beginning farmer, you're going to get a much higher cost share, maybe 90% cost share on that hoop house, as opposed to a 50% cost share help if you were um, in the farming business for a while. So there, it is weighted to young people because we have this major challenge now about repopulating people on our working lands. And we know that local agriculture uh, can be a very important stepping stone. Some people will stay local their entire careers, others will scale up. And so the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food uh, initiative is very much focused on local farmers. What does my friend in Washington State have to say? Um, it's a bit challenging for us because I'm actually working a lot with fishermen and hunters and foragers and harvesters. And so the, the language is a bit different. Uh, we're not, we, in revitalizing traditional food systems, farming um, for the Northwest was not necessarily a part of our, our um, culture, but it, it doesn't mean that those things can't be interwoven together. And that's why I say traditional food and local healthy foods are, um, are part of building a stronger food system for the future. Call from Twitter. Um, and Pam, I, I think I'll toss this one to you. Yes, how can local farmers compete against big box retailers without becoming their teeth? Um, well, uh, what's your experience in New Mexico uh, been with that challenge? 
you know, John, I, I have my, I'm going to have to ask you to and, um, uh, ask that question oh, again because of the interference. I appreciate that. Sorry about that. Well, what's your advice to local yeah. farmers, the yeah. challenge of competing with big box retailers out there without being just a, a boutique operation? What do you think the right approach is there? Actually, um, here in New Mexico, we focused, especially with our New Mexico Food and Agriculture Policy Council, on food retail, mostly in rural communities. So we've done several different things. Um, we've been working with the state to really try and open up the opportunities for uh, funding from the state and federal level for grocery stores. And at the same time, we've been doing what we can to develop infrastructure, refrigeration, and really looking at local distribution systems to hook up with our local farmers to be able to get their product to market. That's the biggest uh, gap for us here in a very rural and very big state um, is that miles to market and linking up. But through Farm to School uh, and linking up with uh, our Farm to Restaurant programs, we're hoping also next year to link up with our food assistance programs who already have trucks on the road. Um, to actually aggregate, you know, bring product together but from the farmers, um, get them on trucks that are already out there, including food assistance program trucks, and deliver to a broader range of institutions, stores, and agencies. And that's going to really help our farmers um, uh, get product into local stores. Big box stores, uh, we do have farmers in the southern part of the state where we have larger producers selling into uh, Walmart. We have more producers who are now selling into um, Whole Foods, and part of that is because of our Outreach and Assistance for Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers program, where we're working directly with farmers uh, to help them ramp up their operation and get all of the requirements like liability insurance, food safety issues, uh, good agricultural practices in order so that they can actually sell to those retail stores as much as they are also to schools and other um, institutions. Oh, those are some really good tips uh, for everyone. Well, uh, Sylvia Brown asks us a question via Twitter. Maybe some of you uh, who are new to the local food movement are wondering too, a definitional question. So Deputy, what's considered local food? Is it distance? Is it region? Does it have anything to do with carbon footprint? Um, the gazillion miles. dollar question. Yes. I um, say it's not time to lock down a definition. And the reason is local is going to depend upon the, the season, the region that you're in, the crop that you're talking about. Um, one of the things this new compass map uh, allows you to do is you can put in your zip code or any zip code, and you can say, how many miles radius do I want to see on the map in terms of the projects and the investments? So people have a sense of what's local in their community. Um, we have one statutory definition as it pertains to only one rural development program at USDA, and it's within 400 miles or within a state. But generally, we are trying to do as local as possible because as many academic studies shows, it helps keep money in the local communities. Um, Georgia just came out with a study that said if everyone spent $10 a week buying local and their grocery bills in the state, it would be $2 billion addition to the local state economy. So, um, you know, there are different ways of slicing this apple. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, well, we have an interesting question uh, from an interesting Twitter handle, Obama Foodorama. Um, and this is for any of our guests. What else would you like to, you've heard a lot about what's happening at USDA, the Compass, which is such a great tool, but what else would you like to see the administration do to support local food? Are there specific policies, more money, something else? Um, uh, Pam, let's start with you and um, uh, open it up to other folks as well. Well, one thing I'd like to say is I really want to, uh, pre I, I really appreciate um, the various USDA programs actually coordinating with each other on some of the initiatives that are beneficial to farmers, ranchers. And I think the Healthy Food Financing Initiative actually is a good example of where the Treasury Department, uh, Nutrition, uh, uh, Food and Nutrition Service, and um, uh, Department of Agriculture have been working together to really look at how to create a program that's more effective and most effective um, in a really variety of ways and through different agencies' approaches to that. 
So we really appreciate that, especially working on food policy work. It makes it easier for us to really um, be involved and um, participate. One thing I'm hoping that'll be up on the Food Compass uh, website at some point are some new documents coming out about food policy councils. Um, those will be out in the next couple of months through the Center for Disease Control and also um, at markwinnie.com. And those I hope will be up on the Compass because it'll help guide those who are interested in local and food policy issues to be able to um, access good resources. Can I jump in there, John? Yeah. One thing people should know is uh, when we launched the first version of the Compass, we said we're going to try to do this four times a year, quarterly updates, and we're still committed to that. And so our next launch, it, I shouldn't even say this with staff in the room because everyone's so exhausted getting to this monumental day today, but our next launch will be end of September, early October. And at that juncture, we plan on working with people in other federal departments to put their investments in local regional food systems on the map. So for example, I met with our director of Centers for Disease Control, Tom Frieden, because they put some money in this space. And I want that put on the map because our president has said when he was on the campaign trail, when he was a senator, and now when he's president, that local food makes sense, it can help create jobs in this economy. And so USDA is not the only player in the game. Excellent. Other advice uh, or things you'd be looking for from the folks on our panel today? Let's ask Corey. What does Corey, Corey? have to say? You know, um, one of the great things about local food is the level of accountability. Um, and our customers care not only about the quality of what we're raising, but also how we're treating our land. And so certainly the conservation component of the Farm Bill is a huge help to local producers. It allows us to do great things on the land that have a wide benefit, but also are important to our customers. So thank you. So since we're doing a shout out for women, I want to say that we are in the midst of a Farm Bill yes, debate. Yeah. And um, we have a number of women leaders. And I w if I try to list them all, I get in real trouble. But I'm going to do two shout outs. Um, one to Shelley Pingree, who's a congresswoman yes. from Maine, who has really been a champion for local foods and, and lives and breathes this, as well as Debbie Sabineau, the senator from Michigan, who not only helped uh, guide through that Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act and, um, and was really um, pivotal in the farm to school piece, but has really fought for very important um, placement of fruits and vegetables in the, um, the Farm Bill title, among other things. So. Uh, we have some really great leaders in Congress, um, both men and women, but I, shout out to the women if you don't well mind. Well deserved, absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Sue, I've, I've got one uh, for you. We've heard from uh, Dina and Lake uh, via Twitter who, who observes, um, in Florida for her, the cohesive nature required to ensure the success of local food distribution system is lacking. And she's wondering for your advice on, on how to help that specifically on the distribution services, the warehousing, food safety regulations. What's your advice to her to bring that together in Florida? Well, a couple of things. She has identified one of the biggest challenges, I think, for us it was anyway, and I suspect for most people out there, distribution is one of the biggest challenges. And when we looked at the fifth season cooperative, how are we going to move that local food from producers and processors into those institutional markets? We said, let's try to not reinvent the wheel, but look at what our assets are in the region. And we have right near us, Reinhardt Food Service in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And they're very interested in moving local food. And so partnering with them, bringing them on as a distributor member has made all the difference in the world for our cooperative. They're very committed to it. The CEO of the lacrosse division sits on the board of directors for the cooperative and is committed to making it happen. So looking at the, the strengths of your region, what are the assets that you have that could help you so you don't have to reinvent the wheel could help. Um, also, I would say regarding the regulations, we're going through that now with our food hub. Contact your Department of Ag or whoever it is that does your inspections for your for your tenants or your businesses and start the communication early don't wait until after you do something and then say did i do it right but get them involved from the beginning we've had the department of ag in the conversation from the beginning and they let us know what the standards are 
and we can be more informed about how to meet them than if we have the dialogue going. So again, it's about building relationships, communicating, all of those good things that leaders know how to do. So those would be my two recommendations. Excellent. John, if I could jump in here, we also funded through the Risk Management Agency at USDA a, a food defense a planning tool for farmers to use. You know, sometimes they have to hire consultants. It's yeah. expensive, a lot of bureaucracy. Um, if you go to familyfarm.org, it's a free downloadable tool. It will really help you in terms of getting the kind of food safety documents together that institutions want when they're buying local. Excellent. Well, Chris, we're getting a lot of interest online about uh, the uh, farm to school program and wondering two questions. What was your biggest barrier to getting things started? And what has been the economic argument as you're talking to school districts? How does the economics play out for them of, of adopting this approach? Uh, probably the biggest barrier of the program was just figuring out how to make it work, how to work with the local farmers, the distribution, what were the needs of the schools, uh, the hands-on activities for the children. Farm to School just brings in so many different facets and so many multiple people can be involved in it. So it's creating that environment of communication and openness and bringing partners together from all walks of life and how can we work it out. Um, economically, what we're seeing is our farmers are competitive. They are wanting to be involved. We can get the food foods to the schools, excuse me, and, and be competitive price-wise. It can provide economic opportunities for the farmers, the communities, those dollars are spent in the communities. So we're seeing some real pluses in the economic aspects of the farm to school program too. It's not really adding on to uh, their bill. It's being, uh, it, it's just a part of their budgets that the schools are incorporating. They want to work with our local farmers. And so it's a, a part of of the entire food system that comes into the schools from our local farmers and from our regional farmers and even on a national basis as well. Excellent, thank you, Chris. And just a reminder to everyone following along on our uh, live stream today, we're using the hashtag WH Hangout. We still, still have time for a few more questions, but, but I have one for Valerie. Um, Valerie, I think what's interesting about the work you're doing is it's not just about local food, but you're really a leader in your community. What's your vision uh, for the future of local food in your community? And, and what, do you, what advice do you have to others about uh, that combination of, of moving your community for, forward and bringing local food into it? You know, it's reminding me just to tell a quick story about what we do. Uh, whenever we hold these events where we're installing any kind of garden or orchard in the community, we always ask an elder to come and to witness the work. And so last April when we installed an orchard at the Muckleshoot Tribal School, I got there and went to my, um, my elder and asked her how she was doing. And she turned and looked at me with these huge tears in her eyes and said that this young man who had just planted a crab apple tree shared with her that he learned that if it's taken care of properly, it will live to be 200 years old. And he said, that means that this is this tree is going to be feeding people long after I'm gone. And she said, I get it. You know, this is what it's about. It's not necessarily about feeding people today, although that's obviously a priority, but also how are we going to feed for feed people who have yet to come? And I think that's a it's a native teaching um, and it's also an opportunity, you know, it's they, these uh, issues are challenging, but they're opportunities to bring people together and to create spaces for people to share their gifts within the community. So for us with traditional foods, um, just like the drought that's happening, we have uh, waters of the Puget Sound that are becoming so acidic, our oysters can't form anymore. Oysters that have been here for millions of years. And those are local foods as well. They're more local than the local. And it's important to take care of our environment, our community, and and have a better relationship with food. And that's what local food, I think, brings to, brings to people, which is powerful. Really powerful. 
It is powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I, I hope it inspires some of our followers online today um, to do what our panel is, is doing here today. Um, uh, we have time for a couple more questions. An interesting one from M. Lindhorst uh, from Syracuse asked via Twitter, what's the intersection between what we can accomplish with local food and food deserts? A challenge that is, is often thought of as an urban situation, but also um, food deserts are in rural areas as well. Pam, do you have, have some initial thoughts? And Deputy, I'd like to ask you as well. Sure. Yeah, I think it's actually a really challenging question. And um, I go back to that idea that we really need to connect um, not only to our local farmers, but to our local distribution systems, um, local local grocery stores. Uh, and um, actually, the, the one distributor that uh, distributes to rural communities in New Mexico is actually from Texas. They do a great job, but we need to just build more of that local um, initiative into our individual states and regions so that as uh, Deputy Secretary Merrigan said, we we're actually building on our local economies and really bringing dollars back home. Um, so we need to really protect what we're doing in both our urban communities and our rural communities. And we also need to really um, be very thoughtful that we have so much connection between each other. That's not um, just urban communities and urban farming. It's not rural and just rural. That we really need each other in this food system, and in particular in this drought year. Fantastic. So, John, there are a lot of things I could say about this issue. I know you. I've been to where you're from. You're yes. really rural. Yes. I'm from rural area too, but I'm the county seat. You know, we get the yes. courthouse and everything. Yes. That's a big sense of pride. Yes. Where, I, anyhow. Um, but uh, reality is. There are a lot of communities in this country where they don't have the population threshold to sustain a brick and mortar uh, grocery store. And sometimes people don't have access to transportation. They may have lost their job. How do they get food? And so one of our strategies that we've been investing in at USDA is going mobile, whether it's a, a meat processing facility that uh, can help people harvest animals, go mobile. Whether it's a food bank truck, that travels to rural communities, go mobile. Whether it is a, a farmer's market sort of event that can go mobile, go mobile. Food carts, go mobile. So there are a lot of different things that we're doing on wheels. So it's an interesting little theme we're having fun with at USDA right now. Great advice and a challenge and I, for the folks today. Yeah, and, a, and if I could just add one more thing to that, actually, in some of our rural communities and underserved communities, actually, instead of building a grocery store or buying a new grocery store, um, people are doing buying clubs and getting product from other places and doing a once a month buying club. The other thing that they're also doing is potentially doing a corner in a hardware store in a rural community that is really about food. So innovative, small investment approaches. Um, and this is where like USDA rural development has been a real benefit to us and kind of helping put that investment back into our rural and underserved communities. Excellent. Well, uh, let's take our last question to Corey before I uh, turn it over to the deputy. Uh, a lot of interest today, people following online who I think are excited to, uh, to move into the local food area themselves. Um, you're in a remote area of Oregon. What are some of the strategies on the marketing end? What is your advice to people as you've successfully marketed the grass-fed beef uh, uh, that you have? Um, you know, I think that that's a great question because one of the things that we fail to recognize is that the customers are really driving this. We're trying to fill in with infrastructure so that we can get, um, you know, in our meat to the customers but it's really the commitment of our buyers that is making our business work and that's that's a pretty great situation um you know in our situation we started out small we went to farmers markets we built a reputation we learned about our product it's a long long process but um once you make those inroads and you develop a brand and people know that they can trust you and they start talking to each other then over time it gets easier it is at the local food level, it is about relationships and whether it's, you know, our customer that's buying a quarter of a cow or um, like OHSU hospital that is buying thousands of pounds of meat for, from us, it's still about those basic relationships. Fantastic. Um, well, uh, Deputy Secretary, what are some of your thoughts as we close out today? Jobs, 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 jobs. Um, I just wanna throw out, um, a few things that are going on out there. North Carolina, they have the 10% campaign, 
which is fun. They're challenging people to spend 10% of their food budget on local. And people, if they do the pledge, they get a local, a weekly email and they, they say what they bought. Um, since uh, July 2010, they've had over 5,000 people sign up, 669 businesses, including some big ones like Compass Food Group. And they have um, documented they've spent more than $17 million wow. locally. So they're having a lot of fun with that. Excellent. Illinois did a study, and they found that if Illinois farmers met current fresh produce demand, it would be $264 million in farm sales and 2,600 jobs. West Virginia did a study just this year, finding that if West uh, Virginia producers met local produce demand in season, $120 million, 1,700 new jobs. In Iowa, my boss is state, I have to get yes. Iowa in. You know, I work for a secretary, yeah, of course. Um, they uh, saw that there would be 60 million in sales from Iowa. Um, they saw 60 million sales from Iowa farmers markets, 600 jobs in the markets and related industries, 1,500 Iowa farmers sell at those markets. So we're starting to get more and more data that shows that this is not a, a passing trend. It's not a little niche, but it can be a really important economic engine. And I think that's really important. So. Again, people out there who are trying to navigate USDA's huge bureaucracy and our myriad of programs, we have brought you the tool. We have built it. Please come. The Compass will help you navigate and network. Have fun. Happy mapping. All right. And that is our big ask of everyone who's participated today. Help us get the word out. Help us get the word out about the stories you heard here today, what inspired you. Get the word out about the Compass. And in fact, if you want to continue the conversation, um, we are going to have a question and answer session via Twitter on Tuesday, July 24th at 1.30 Eastern time. We're going to be using the hashtags AskUSA and KYF2. So a big, big thanks to everyone and the work you're doing on local food across the country. Let's keep this conversation going. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.